Section 31 of The Essence of Christianity by Ludwig Feuerbach. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Essence of Christianity by Ludwig Feuerbach. Translated from the German by Marian Evans. Chapter 26 The Contradiction of Faith and Love. Part 1. The sacraments are a sensible presentation of that contradiction of idealism and materialism, of subjectivism and objectivism, which belongs to the inmost nature of religion. But the sacraments are nothing without faith and love. Hence the contradiction in the sacraments carries us back to the primary contradiction of faith and love. The essence of religion, its latent nature, is the identity of the divine being with the human. But the form of religion, or its apparent conscious nature, is the distinction between them. God is the human being, but he presents himself to the religious consciousness as a distinct being. Now that which reveals the basis, the hidden essence of religion, is love that which constitutes its conscious form is faith love identifies man with god and god with man consequently it identifies man with man faith separates god from man consequently it separates man from man for god is nothing else than the idea of the species invested with a metaphysical form the separation of god from man is therefore the separation of man from man the unloosening of the social bond by faith religion places itself in contradiction with morality with reason with the unsophisticated sense of truth in man by love it opposes itself again to this contradiction faith isolates god it makes him a particular distinct being love universalizes it makes god a common being the love of whom is one with the love of man faith produces in man an inward disunion a disunion with himself and by consequence an outward disunion also but love heals the wounds which are made by faith in the heart of man. Faith makes belief in its God a law. Love is freedom. It condemns not even the atheist, because it is itself atheistic, itself denies, if not theoretically, at least practically, the existence of a particular individual God opposed to man love has god in itself faith has god out of itself it estranges god from man it makes him an external object faith being inherently external proceeds even to the adoption of outward fact as its object and becomes historical faith it is therefore the nature of faith that it can become a totally external confession and that with mere faith as such superstitious magical effects are associated the devils believe that god is without ceasing to be devils hence a distinction has to be made between faith in god and belief that there is a god but even with this bare belief in the existence of god the assimilating power of love is intermingled a power which by no means lies in the idea of faith as such, in in so far as it relates to external things. The only distinctions or judgments which are imminent to faith, which spring out of itself, are the distinctions of right or genuine and wrong or false faith, or in general of belief and unbelief faith discriminates thus this is true 
that is false. And it claims truth to itself alone. Faith has for its object a definite, specific truth which is necessarily united with negation. Faith is in its nature exclusive. One thing alone is truth, one alone is God, one alone has the monopoly of being the Son of God, all else is nothing, error, delusion. Jehovah alone is the true God, all other gods are vain idols. Faith has in its mind something peculiar to itself. It rests on a peculiar revelation of God. It has not come to its possessions in an ordinary way, that way which stands open to all men alike. What stands open to all is common, and for that reason cannot form a special object of faith. That God is creator, all men could know from nature. But what this God is in person can be known only by special grace, is the object of a special faith. And because he is only revealed in a peculiar manner, the object of this faith is himself a peculiar being. The God of the Christians is indeed the God of the heathens, but with a wide difference, just such a difference as there is between me as I am to a friend, and me as I am to a stranger, who only knows me at a distance. God as he is an object to Christians is quite another than as he is an object to heathens. The Christians know God personally, face to face. The heathens know only, and even this is too large an admission, what and not who God is for which reason they fell into idolatry. The identity of the heathens and Christians before God is therefore altogether vague. What the heathens have in common with the Christians, if indeed we consent to be so liberal as to admit anything in common between them, is not that which is specifically Christian, not that which constitutes faith. In whatsoever the Christians are Christians, therein they are distinguished from the heathens, and they are Christians in virtue of their special knowledge of God. Thus their mark of distinction is God. Speciality is the salt which first gives a flavor to the common being. What a being is in special is the being itself. He alone knows me who knows me in specia. Thus the special God, God as he is an object to the Christians, the personal God, is alone God. And this God is unknown to the heathens, and to unbelievers in general. He does not exist for them. He is indeed said to exist for the heathens, but mediately, on condition that they cease to be heathens and become Christians. Faith makes man partial and narrow. It deprives him of the freedom and ability to estimate duly what is different from himself. Faith is imprisoned within itself. It is true that the philosophical, or in general any scientific theorist, also limits himself by a definite system. But theoretic limitation, however fettered, short-sighted, and narrow-hearted it may be, has still a freer character than faith, because the domain of theory is in itself a free one, because here the ground of decision is the nature of things, argument, reason. But faith refers to the decision to conscience and interest, to the instinctive desire of happiness, for its object is a special personal being, urging himself on recognition and making salvation dependent on that recognition. Faith gives man a peculiar sense of his own dignity and importance. The believer finds himself distinguished above other men, exalted above the natural man. He knows himself to be a person of distinction, in the possession of peculiar privileges. Believers are aristocrats, unbelievers plebeians. God is this distinction and preeminence of believers above unbelievers personified. 
Because faith represents man's own nature as that of another being, the believer does not contemplate his dignity immediately in himself, but in this supposed distinct person. The consciousness of his own preeminence presents itself as a consciousness of this person. He has a sense of his own dignity in this divine personality. As the servant feels himself honored in the dignity of his master, nay, fancies himself greater than a free, independent man of lower rank than his master, so it is with the believer. He denies all merit in himself, merely that he may leave all merit to his Lord, because his own desire of honor is satisfied in the honor of his Lord. Faith is arrogant, but it is distinguished from natural arrogance in this, that it clothes its feelings of superiority, its pride, in the idea of another person, for whom the believer is an object of peculiar favor. This distinct person, however, is simply his own hidden self, his personified, contented desire of happiness, for he has no other qualities than these, that he is the benefactor, the redeemer, the saviour, qualities in which the believer has reference only to himself, to his own eternal salvation. In fact, we have here the characteristic principle of religion, that it changes that which is naturally active into the passive. The heathen elevates himself, the Christian feels himself elevated. The Christian converts into a matter of feeling, of receptivity, what to the heathen is a matter of spontaneity. The humility of the believer is an inverted arrogance, an arrogance nonetheless because it has not the appearance the external characteristics of arrogance. He feels himself preeminent. This preeminence, however, is not a result of his activity, but a matter of grace. He has been made preeminent. He can do nothing towards it himself. He does not make himself the end of his own activity, but the end, the object of God. Faith is essentially determinate specific god according to the specific view taken of him by faith is alone the true god this jesus such as i conceive him is the christ the true sole prophet the only begotten son of god and this peculiar conception thou must believe if thou wouldst not forfeit thy salvation faith is imperative it is therefore necessary, it lies in the nature of faith, that it be fixed as dogma. Dogma only gives a formula to what faith has already on its tongue or in its mind. That when once a fundamental dogma is established, it gives rise to more special questions, which must also be thrown into a dogmatic form that hence there results a burdensome multiplicity of dogmas. This is certainly a fatal consequence, but does not do away with the necessity that faith should fix itself in dogmas, in order that every one may know, definitely, what he must believe and how he can win salvation. That which in the present day, even from the standpoint of believing Christianity, is rejected, is compassionated as an aberration, as a misinterpretation, or is even ridiculed, is purely a consequence of the inmost nature of faith. Faith is essentially illiberal, prejudiced, for it is concerned not only with individual salvation, but with the honor of God. And just as we are solicitous as to whether we show due honor to a superior in rank, so it is with faith. The Apostle Paul is absorbed in the glory, the honor, the merits of Christ. Dogmatic, exclusive, scrupulous, particularity lies in the nature of faith. In food and other matters indifferent to faith, it is certainly liberal but by no means in relation to objects of faith. He who is not for Christ is against him. 
That which is not Christian is anti-Christian. But what is Christian? This must be absolutely determined. This cannot be free. If the articles of faith are set down in books, which proceed from various authors, handed down in the form of incidental, mutually contradictory, occasional dicta, then dogmatic demarcation and definition are even an external necessity. Christianity owes its perpetuation to the dogmatic formulas of the church. It is only the believing unbelief of modern times which hides itself behind the Bible and opposes the biblical dicta to dogmatic definitions, in order that it may set itself free from the limits of dogma by arbitrary exegesis. But faith has already disappeared, is become indifferent when the determinate tenets of faith are felt as limitations. It is only religious indifference under the appearance of religion that makes the Bible, which in its nature and origin is indefinite, a standard of faith, and under the pretext of the name of faith, for example, substituting for the distinctly characterized Son of God, held up by the Church, the vague negative definition of a sinless man, who can claim to be the Son of God, in a sense applicable to no other being, in a word, of a man whom one may not trust oneself to call either a man or a god. But that it is merely indifference which makes a hiding place for itself behind the Bible is evident from the fact that even what stands in the Bible, if it contradicts the standpoint of the present day, is regarded as not obligatory, or is even denied, Nay, actions which are essentially Christian, which are the logical consequences of faith, such as the separation of believers from unbelievers, are now designated as unchristian. The church was perfectly justified in adjudging damnation to heretics and unbelievers, for this condemnation is involved in the nature of faith. Faith at first appears to be only an unprejudiced separation of believers from unbelievers. But this separation is a highly critical distinction. The believer has God for him, the unbeliever against him. It is only as a possible believer that the unbeliever has God not against him. And therein precisely lies the ground of the requirement that he should leave the ranks of unbelief. But that which has God against it is worthless, rejected, reprobate, for that which has God against it is itself against God. To believe is synonymous with goodness, not to believe with wickedness. Faith, narrow and prejudiced, refers all unbelief to the moral disposition. In its view, the unbeliever is an enemy to Christ, out of obduracy, out of wickedness. Hence faith has fellowship with believers only, unbelievers it rejects. It is well disposed towards believers, but ill disposed toward unbelievers. In faith there lies a malignant principle. It is owing to the egoism, the vanity, the self-complacency of Christians that they can see the motes in the faith of non-Christian nations, but cannot perceive the beam in their own. It is only in the mode in which faith embodies itself that Christians differ from the followers of other religions. The distinction is founded only on climate or on natural temperament. A warlike or ardently sensuous people will naturally attest to its distinctive religious character by deeds, by force of arms. But the nature of faith as such is everywhere the same. It is essential to faith to condemn, to anathematize. All blessings, all good, it accumulates on itself, on its God, as the lover on his beloved. All curses, all hardship and evil, it casts on unbelief. The believer is blessed, well-pleasing to God, a partaker of everlasting felicity. The unbeliever is accursed, rejected of God, and abjured by men. For what God rejects, man must not receive, must not indulge. 
that would be a criticism of the divine judgment the turks exterminate unbelievers with fire and sword the christians with the flames of hell but the fires of the other world blaze forth into this to glare through the night of unbelief as a believer already here below anticipates the joys of heaven so the flames of the abyss must be seen to flash here as a foretaste of the awaiting hell at least in the moments when faith attains its highest enthusiasm it is true that christianity ordains no persecution of heretics still less conversion by force of arms but so far as faith anathematizes it necessarily generates hostile dispositions the dispositions out of which the persecution of heretics arises to love the man who does not believe in christ is a sin against christ is to love the enemy of christ that which god which christ does not love man must not love his love would be a contradiction of the divine will consequently a sin god it is true loves all men but only when and because they are christians or at least may be and desire to be such to be a christian is to be beloved by god not to be a christian is to be hated by god an object of the divine anger the christians must therefore love only christians others only as possible christians he must only love what faith hallows and blesses faith is the baptism of love love to man as man is only natural love christian love is supernatural glorified sanctified love therefore it loves only what is christian the maxim love your enemies has reference only to personal enemies not to public enemies the enemies of god the enemies of faith unbelievers he who loves the man whom christ denies does not believe christ denies his lord and god faith abolishes the natural ties of humanity to universal natural unity it substitutes a particular unity let it not be objected to this that it is said in the bible judge not that ye be not judged and that thus as faith leaves to god the judgment so it leaves to him the sentence of condemnation this and other similar sayings have authority only as the private law of christians not as their public law belong only to ethics not to dogmatics it is an indication of indifference to faith to introduce such things into the region of dogma the distinction between the unbeliever and the man is a fruit of modern philanthropy to faith the man is merged in the believer to it the essential difference between man and the brute rests only on religious belief faith alone comprehends in itself all virtues which can make man pleasing to god and god is the absolute measure his pleasure the highest law the believer is thus alone the legitimate normal man man as he ought to be man as he is recognized by god wherever we find christians making a distinction between the man and the believer there the human mind has already severed itself from faith there man has value in himself independently of faith hence faith is true unfeigned only where the specific difference of faith operates in all its severity if the edge of this difference is blunted faith itself naturally becomes indifferent effete faith is liberal only in things intrinsically indifferent the liberalism of the apostle paul presupposes the acceptance of the fundamental articles of faith where everything is made to depend on the fundamental articles of faith there arises the distinction between essential and non-essential belief in the sphere of the non-essential there is no law there you are free but obviously it is only on condition of your leaving the rights of faith intact 
that faith allows you freedom. It is therefore an altogether false defense to say that faith leaves judgment to God. It leaves to him only the moral judgment with respect to faith, only the judgment as to its moral character, as to whether the faith of Christians be feigned or genuine. So far as classes are concerned, faith knows already whom God will place on the right hand and whom on the left. In relation to the persons who compose the classes, faith is uncertain. But that believers are heirs of the eternal kingdom is beyond all doubt. Apart from this, however, the God who distinguishes between believers and unbelievers, the condemning and rewarding God, is nothing else than faith itself. What God condemns, faith condemns, and vice versa. Faith is a consuming fire to its opposite. This fire of faith, regarded objectively, is the anger of God, or what is the same thing, hell. For hell evidently has its foundations in the anger of God. But this hell lies in faith itself, in its sentence of damnation. The flames of hell are only the flashings of the exterminating, vindictive glance which faith casts on unbelievers. Thus faith is essentially a spirit of partisanship. He who is not for Christ is against him. Faith knows only friends or enemies. It understands no neutrality. It is preoccupied only with itself. Faith is essentially intolerant, essentially because with faith is always associated the illusion that its cause is the cause of God, its honor, his honor. The God of faith is nothing else than the objective nature of faith, faith become an object to itself. Hence in the religious consciousness also the cause of faith and the cause of God are identified. God himself is interested. The interest of faith is the nearest interest of God. He who toucheth you, says the prophet Zechariah, toucheth the apple of his eye. That which wounds faith wounds God. That which denies faith denies God himself. Faith knows no other distinction than that between the service of God and the service of idols. Faith alone gives honor to God. Unbelief withdraws from God that which is due to him. Unbelief is an injury to God, religious high treason. The heathens worship demons, their gods are devils. I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils, and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. But the devil is the negation of God. He hates God, wills that there should be no God. Thus faith is blind to what there is of goodness and truth lying at the foundation of heathen worship. It sees in everything which does not do homage to its God, i.e. to itself, a worship of idols, and in the worship of idols only the work of the devil. Faith must therefore, even in feeling, be only negative towards this negation of God. It is by inherent necessity intolerant towards its opposite, and in general, towards whatever does not thoroughly accord with itself. Tolerance on its part would be intolerance towards God, who has the right to unconditional, undivided sovereignty. Nothing ought to subsist, nothing to exist, which does not acknowledge God, which does not acknowledge faith. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Therefore faith postulates a future, a world where faith has no longer an opposite, 
where at least this opposite exists only in order to enhance the self-complacency of triumphant faith. Hell sweetens the joys of happy believers. The elect will come forth to behold the torments of the ungodly, and at this spectacle they will not be smitten with sorrow. On the contrary, while they see the unspeakable sufferings of the ungodly, they, intoxicated with joy, will thank God for their own salvation. Faith is the opposite of love. Love recognizes virtue even in sin, truth in error. It is only since the power of faith has been supplanted by the power of the natural unity of mankind, the power of reason of humanity, that truth has been seen even in polytheism, in idolatry generally, or at least that there has been an, any attempt to explain on positive grounds what faith in its bigotry derives only from the devil. Hence love is reconcilable with reason alone not with faith. For as reason, so also love is free, universal in its nature, wherein faith is narrow-hearted, limited. Only where reason rules does universal love rule. Reason is itself nothing else than universal love. It was faith, not love, not reason, which invented hell. To love Hell is a horror, to reason an absurdity. It would be a pitiable mistake to regard hell as a mere aberration of faith, a false faith. Hell stands already in the Bible. Faith is everywhere like itself, at least positive religious faith, faith in the sense in which it is here taken and must be taken unless we would mix with it the elements of reason of culture, a mixture which indeed renders the character of faith unrecognizable. Thus, if faith does not contradict Christianity, neither do those dispositions which result from faith, neither do the actions which result from those dispositions. Faith condemns, anathematizes. All the actions, all the dispositions which contradict love, humanity, reason, accord with faith. All the horrors of Christian religious history, which our believers aver not to be due to Christianity, have truly arisen out of Christianity, because they have arisen out of faith. This repudiation of them is indeed a necessary consequence of faith, for faith claims for itself only what is good. Everything is bad, it casts on the shoulders of unbelief, or of misbelief, or of men in general. But this very denial of faith, that it is itself to blame for all the evil in Christianity, is a striking proof that it is really the originator of that evil, because it is a proof of the narrowness, partiality, and intolerance which render it well disposed only to itself, to its own adherence, but ill-disposed unjust toward others. End of section 31